Just thinking about it, there's the mic unmuting itself. Something should go wrong to start every video broadcast. We've learned this after three years together. Uh, my name is Jesse, and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. For those of you joining us for the first time, perhaps in the zoo's YouTube or Facebook pages today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through over 50 live, free, monthly interactive broadcasts. We've had the pleasure of bringing every single one of those to our YouTube channel, so you can check out every single thing we've ever done in like seven years right there, including I think over 50 programs with the Toronto Zoo over the last few years in particular. It is always such a pleasure to get to bring you such amazing programs from your Toronto Zoo. We've covered everything from polar bears to tigers, uh, indigenous knowledge to uh, really pretty much every topic and every pavilion and center you can find at the Toronto Zoo. They are our favorite partners. Don't tell our other partners. We love the Toronto Zoo. It's such a pleasure having them on. And a big welcome to our audience today as we continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing people in places around the globe. Now today we are going to dive in in anticipation of tomorrow's World Migratory Bird Day with an entire program about our amazing feathered friends. We're going to learn about some of the coolest adaptations birds have. We're going to see some cool bio facts. We might see some live birds together outdoors on what is supposed to be a truly stunning day in Toronto for our international audience today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our incredible zoo team. We're going to learn a lot together, have a lot of fun, and I look forward to all of your questions in the chats as well. Mary Ellen and team, I'm turning it over to you guys and welcome to the broadcast. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you so much. I'm just standing behind the camera here right now and Jesse is right, it is a beautiful day here in Toronto. Uh, so we're gonna look at one of our beautiful trees here while we just quickly do our land acknowledgement before we get started learning all about birds, what makes them so amazing and celebrating uh, World Migratory Day for tomorrow. So the Toronto Zoo acknowledges that the land that we are standing on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. All right, thank you so much, everyone. We are so excited. And I'm actually going to stay behind the camera now and turn it over. I've got one of my colleagues here, John, and he is going to be leading us through this amazing program. So welcome, John. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As it's been said, it is a really beautiful day here at the Toronto Zoo. And I'm very excited to be talking to you all about birds. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Spiro, although often it is pronounced as Sparrow. I'm not sure if that's how I ended up working with birds or not, um, but I am really passionate about birds. A bit about me, I, birds weren't always my favorite animals. I have always really loved animals in general from uh, early on as a kid. Uh, I liked all, all sorts of animals. Um, at one point I wanted to be a veterinarian, but uh, that was a little too long in school. So then I decided maybe I would want to be a marine biologist. Then I realized that the ocean kind of freaks me out. Um, but when I went to school, I went to the University of Guelph to study zoology. Uh, when I went there, I thought I wanted to work with either reptiles or tarantulas. I, those were some of my favorite animals to work with at that point. Uh, but it was when I was there that I first got my real exposure to some really awesome birds, which kind of changed the direction of my life. And it was there I started volunteering with a group of birds that we call raptors. Now, how cool is that, that they're called raptors to begin with? It makes you think of Jurassic Park, perhaps. Um, and that really caught my attention. Uh, I started working with a, a, a broadwing hawk there, just a small hawk about this size. And uh, just working with that bird, learning about them, really kind of sparked my fascination with birds. And now I've, I've started to, to really love all birds, but especially those birds of prey. And how could you not? Like, think of how cool they are. So this here, these are talons, different claws here. And this is what birds of prey or raptors will use to capture the prey that they go after. Look at the size of some of those. So this one here is a, a harpy eagle. And now that's the heaviest uh, eagle species in the world. You find these birds in South America. Down there, they'll hunt monkeys and sloths. They're very powerful predators, uh, really incredible. Uh, next to it, you can see the golden eagle and the bald eagle. Now these are actually two species you'd find in North America. You can find them here in Toronto and uh, bald eagles in particular, you find them on the coast throughout North America or any of the, the Great Lakes or a great spot to find them anywhere that there's really good fishing. So that really did spark my interest and it kind of makes sense because something that I've always really loved 
uh, even as a child, was dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were my favorite. Who doesn't love dinosaurs? Everyone here has seen at least one of the now 17 Jurassic Park movies. Well, that, uh, that definitely always fascinated me. And I started to learn that uh, not only were birds related to dinosaurs, they actually are dinosaurs. That's pretty incredible. So I'm the lead keeper of birds at the Toronto Zoo. I think that we should change this title to the lead keeper of dinosaurs. I'm still working on management to try to change this badge here, but uh, I digress. But check this out. This here is a fossil of an Archaeopteryx. So an Archaeopteryx is a dinosaur that is covered in feathers. Now, if you look here at the fossil, you can see the outline and you can actually see the shape of the feathers on the wing here. You can see the tail comes down here and it's covered in feathers as well. So this Archaeopteryx, this was a discovery made in Berlin. Um, and this was one of the first things that really opened up people's eyes and made them start to think that maybe all the dinosaurs didn't go extinct. Um, as you can see, this, this dinosaur here looks very similar to a bird with all those feathers. That's one of the things that we classify birds with is, is the fact that they do have feathers. But we're finding more and more of these dinosaurs, the ones that walk on two feet, which we call theropods. These dinosaurs do tend to be covered in feathers. And now we've discovered that, in fact, um, birds are the only living dinosaurs. So how cool is that? Now, what with the birds, like we were talking about, the birds of prey, that does, it makes sense. They're, they're raptors, just like we think of the velociraptor that we see in those movies. They're hunting things with their powerful claws, just like uh, you might imagine a dinosaur to do. But um, dinosaurs weren't all meat eaters. Some of them were vegetarians. And many of them occu occupied many different things that we call a niche. So what we think of as a niche in an environment, that's kind of the role that an animal plays in the environment. So you can think of a hummingbird. It visits uh, flowers and it collects nectar. Um, that's part of its niche. So what happened when the, in about 66 million years ago, when all of the major, all the large dinosaurs and the pterosaurs, those flying uh, reptiles, when a lot of them went extinct, birds and mammals, they were still alive at the same time as those dinosaurs. But when a lot of those larger dinosaurs died away, that opened up these new event uh, 66 million years ago that caused all those dinosaurs to die off. You can imagine all these niches started, uh, were no longer being filled. So what that allowed was for mammals and birds to diversify. So they started taking on all these different uh, forms to occupy these different niches that now opened up in nature. Now, people don't realize how incredible the diversity of avian species are. Now, a lot of us are more familiar with mammals because we're mammals. We tend to relate to them more. People have dogs and cats in their house. Um, so we do. We tend to know a lot more about mammals than we do about some of the other animals that we share our environment and that we share the planet with. But uh, mammals, there's about 5,000 species of mammals, just over. It's pretty incredible. But when it comes to birds, it's more than double that. There's between 10 and 11,000 bird species on this planet occupying all kinds of these different niches. So we talked about the, the meat-eating niche. Um, but check this out. Here you can see a bit of that diversity in terms of their beak. So the beak is one of the main tools that birds have. And you can see how they've uh, adapted all these different forms based on whatever niche they might be fulfilling out there in the wild. So here we've got that raptorial niche. You can see that curved beak helps for tearing prey. Uh, look up here, we've got the toucan. Everyone recognizes the, the beloved toucan. It's got a really large beak and it can use that for crushing uh, fruit or nuts. Um, you, can, you can keep going here. We've got uh, a flamingo. Here I've actually got uh, a replica flamingo skull. You can see that. How incredible. It's so different than any other uh, group of birds. And what they use this for is filter feeding. So they go down there in the water and they open up their, their beak just slightly, filtering out uh, small crustaceans and things that they can find in the water column. Now, keep going along here. We've got uh, some insect-eating birds, um, things like warblers. A lot of those, you'll see those during migratory, uh, migrating at this time. They're all coming down from the tropics. 
uh, down here for uh, to breed in other parts of North America. We've got some grain eating birds, things like finches. Look at this. We've got this songbird here. This is called a crossbill. So its beak is specialized actually just to eat the seeds out of pine cones. It uses that beak and because it's crossed like that, it can easily open up the pine cone and get at the seeds in there. We've got the, the hummingbird beak here, you can see, so it can get deep inside of a flower and collect the nectar, also helping to pollinate those flowers as well. Now we've got the scavenging beak of a vulture, similar shape to a uh, the raptor beak that you can see here. Now right here, we've got a chiseling beak. So this here is a, a woodpecker, of course. Now they've got an incredible adaptation with that beak. They hammer away at uh, logs so that they, they can get to the insects inside with incredible force. So here we've got a, uh, this is a pileated woodpecker. It's a pretty large species of woodpecker. You can see that really long beak, very powerful. Now I don't know if you can see it in the, uh, the camera here. Can you see that groove along the top of the skull? Yeah. Well, if you can't see it, you have to take my word for it. There is a groove here. That's actually where their tongue folds around. So their tongue inside here in their mouth, it actually comes and it folds around the back of the skull because it's so long that they can't keep it in their, their mouth like other birds would. It wraps around their skull. And then when they are nailing away, looking for grubs inside of a, a tree, that tongue can come out extra long and try to grab that, that prey item. So very specialized uh, beak and even the skull there for this species. Now, of course, we are here to talk about migration. Tomorrow is World Migratory Bird Day. Uh, it's pretty a pretty incredible thing that happens every year in the spring and the fall. We have thousands and thousands of birds making their way down from the north uh, all the way into the, the Arctic regions, all the way south to South America. Um, some species like the turkey vulture, which you find in, in Toronto, which you can find them throughout uh, North America. They'll, they'll make their way all the way down from Canada, sometimes all the way to, to South America. It's incredible. Even small species um, like hummingbirds, they have to migrate because you can imagine here, um, if it gets too cold and there's no flowers for them to find nectar, they're going to have to find another resource. So that's one of the, the driving forces for why birds migrate. It's not necessarily the cold. It's more so finding the resources that they need. So they come down here uh, when it's nice and warm. There's all kinds of insects. Uh, there's flowers. There's all sorts of berries, things that they can eat. Um, and then that allows them to raise young in a place that's rich in resources so that they can have more offspring. But once those conditions change a little bit, it's time for them to head south. They go on a little vacation to South America. And over there, conditions are, are more favorable. They hang out there for a while. Again, they can find their resources. And then in the fall, they'll make their way back down again. So here you can see um, in North America, we've got four of these flyways. So these, these birds are making this trip uh, every year. And they actually will tend to take the same route all of the time. It's very cool. We don't know exactly what causes them to take uh, these, these same routes. Sometimes they might learn from a flock, just so you can imagine a younger goose joining up with the other geese and, and learning that way. Sometimes though it's genetic. So here at the Toronto Zoo, we breed uh, a species of songbird. It's called the Eastern Loggerhead Shrike. It's a really cool songbird. Um, and we release these birds every year back into the wild. Now this is a migratory species. So somehow they have to figure out how to get from where we release them uh, down into the south and then they make their way back again. And we actually have seen them do that. We've seen them return to the areas where they've been released. So it's pretty incredible that they're doing that. They don't have uh, someone to teach them that. They're figuring this out on their own. So yeah, it could be genetics. It could be uh, land markers. As you'll see here, birds don't like to fly uh, over water bodies. Now, the reason for that is flying over land, they can use something that we call uh, air thermals. So when the sun comes down and heats up the earth, that air, as you know, heat rises, or maybe you didn't, now you do. Heat rises into the air. So large birds can hold their wings open and they can actually use that to get lift. And that will save them some energy. You can imagine how incredibly expensive in terms of energy it would be to fly from South America uh, to Canada. Us humans, it's expensive 
this way when we want to make a trip down there. But for birds, it costs them a lot in calories. So birds eat an incredible amount of food before they make this migration. Some species can double in their body weight so that they have enough in reserve to make this trip. Some species, when they're flying, they'll actually start to metabolize. And what that means is they start to actually break down their own muscle tissue to give them energy so that they can make the flight. Like that is so incredible. Some of them can even uh, shorten or lengthen their intestinal tract to reduce their weight. Everything about a bird is designed to be efficient in flight. They're very incredible species. And this migration is just one example of uh, some of the incredible things that they're capable of. So we're talking a lot about um, bird wings, of course, that's essential for making this migration for them. Um, now you might be wondering how it is a bird flies. Is it like a hand? Uh, is it like similar to our own hand that's been modified with feathers? Um, there's a few different species that have uh, mastered flight though. Can anyone else name another group of animals besides birds that knows how to fly, that can fly Ooh. sustainably? What do you guys well, think out there? I'm going to, I'm going to take some live classes if they want to chime in with this. Uh, let's see. Uh, Miss Luge class, what other group of animals can fly? We got birds we're talking about, of course. What else? Uh, insects. Insects. Very yep, good. Definitely. Uh, definitely. Mr. Insects. Hancock's class, there's one other that should jump to mind here. We, somebody was thinking maybe bats. Bats. Yes, exactly. Oh, John, they know yeah. what they're doing these classes. They're the best. <laughs> well, there's one other, uh, one other group I'm thinking of. It is a reptile that is extinct. Mm. We did mention it earlier. Can anyone? Oh, we did. Oh, we're going into the extinct realm as well. well Let's see if any of our YouTube friends have got us. Uh, does anyone chime in on YouTube or Facebook? No, we got more bats. Everyone's really keen on bats. Uh, yeah, that's, well, that's, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I think pterosaurs might be our answer we're looking for here. There we go. Special. That's it. So, so um, flight has evolved a few times in nature. It's, it's happened. You guys named them all. It's happened in birds. It's happened in insects. It's happened in mammals with bats, and it's happened with reptiles uh, with the pterosaur. But it's all happened uh, kind of differently. So check out this bat wing here. So you can see this is similar to my arm here. You can see that's the same, the humerus, and then the radius and all. Now these are all the same. And then it's once you get into the, the hand where things change. So with the bat wing, you can see it's, it's, it's fingers that have adapted and the skin grows in between the fingers and then connects to their body. So that's how that wing uh, forms. With birds though, it's a little bit different. So this here is kind of like what our hand would be. So a lot of the bones have fused together. They've lost a lot of the individual digits or fingers and they have these fused bones that the, bird, the, the feathers attach to here. Now really cool here on the pterosaur, it's, it's different again. This is actually just one, almost, it would be like equivalent to one of our long fingers, almost like a pinky finger right there that has just gone, uh, grown really large. And it's sort of like the bat with the skin that attaches from that tip all the way down. And then you can see it's got these digits here that it could still grasp with. So it's happened a few different ways. And even in today, the diversity of uh, wing shapes that you see with birds is pretty incredible. Um, it all serves different functions. You can see the hovering wing of a, a hummingbird. Um, this wing shape, th these birds can uh, flap their wings an incredible number of times per second. You can't even see it. You have to watch it with a slow-mo camera. And you can see here, we've got a falcon wing. Now, remember that. You might be seeing something like that in real life very soon. Then here, we've got a kind of short, broad wing. That would be something like a an owl. We've actually got one of those wings here. So this wing here, short, broad, this is perfect for navigating through thick forests where you would find uh, a great horned owl. Not the best for sustained flight, but they can be as quick as they need to be. It's also very silent. Um, when, these, when these birds fly, they can sneak up on their prey. So they don't have to be incredibly fast. And then we've got... Um, Here's the uh, soaring wing of something like a turkey vulture or a hawk. Again, that's really great for using those hot air thermals that we mentioned earlier. And then this here is a seabird wing. Could be something like a gull. Now I mentioned that the hot air thermals don't rise uh, over water bodies, but this shape of wing allows them to use the wind. So if wind conditions are right, they can soar effortlessly on, on the, uh, the water there. Um, 
So I think we've talked enough about some of the uh, uh, birds in general. I think we should look at some specific birds, some really cool birds. We're actually going to look at some of the birds that uh, really got me fascinated with birds. So let's head on over here and we'll meet. Oh, actually, before we head over there, I have one last thing to show you guys. Almost cool. forgot. So this here. Oh. Is, does anyone know what? What do you think this is? It's not a cantaloupe. Ooh. Okay, hi Bush class. If you guys want to unmute your mic, I'll come to you to see what you guys think. What do we think okay. that is? Hi. Uh, what do you think, guys? What do you think this might be? Let's put up a hand. Um, what do you think, Kira? Yeah, maybe ostrich. Ostrich. ostrich egg. Wow. wow. You, guys, yeah, you guys are good. That's exactly what this is. This is a, an ostrich egg. It's the largest egg um, on the planet uh, for any living species. Um, so this ostrich egg. It's equivalent to about 20 chicken eggs. Can you imagine making an omelet out of one of these? Mm. All right. Now on that, we'll head on over and check out a special little guy. His name is Leonard. Amazing. While you're heading, John, I'll just say that we're going to put in a good word for Dolph for you to get you the dinosaur badge that you want. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. We're going to make Perfect. that happen. <laughs> so check this out here. Oh, This is uh, Leonard, and he is an American kestrel. So a kestrel here, that's a type of falcon. And falcons are among some of the fastest animals in the world. Anyone here heard of the peregrine falcon? We've heard of the peregrine falcon. We're very familiar, but we don't want to upset our kestrel friend here because he's beautiful <laughs> just in and of himself. What a glorious bird. Oh. So the, uh, the peregrine falcon is uh, yeah, one of the fastest animals on the planet when they're flying and diving down towards prey. Uh, they like to hunt after other birds on the wing. They can fly over 300 kilometers an hour. For those in the U.S., I think that's like 220 miles or something. Jesse can do the conversion for me. <laughs> that's my job. Um, uh, the kestrel here, their, their hunting style is a little bit different, but they have a lot of the same features. You can see on his beak there, he's got a little ridge there. That's called a, a tomial tooth, and that helps him to uh, take care of the prey items after he's got them firm in his talons. You'll also see the stripe that he has down his face. That's called a, a mallard stripe. You see that same feature on, uh, on cheetahs as well. And even football players will put a black line on their face. That helps the, to stop the glare of the sun from reflecting back into their eyes. So what they can do, they'll actually chase a prey item, a small songbird, towards the sun. And the prey item will be blinded by the sun's glare, but the falcon is able to focus and make sure it can make quick work of that prey. So the American kestrel here, as the name suggests, you do find them uh, in America, but you can find them around uh, North America. They're a very common species here. Sometimes people might mistake them for something like a, a dove, a mourning dove. They are a similar size. You can uh, tell these birds apart though. They've got a larger head. Sometimes you'll see them sitting on telephone lines kind of bobbing their head, uh, looking for prey. Now, birds have very incredible eyesight. So they can actually see into the ultraviolet color spectrum. What that means is they're seeing colors that, that all of us can't see. Our eyes aren't capable of seeing those colors. Now, what they can do is they can fly over a field. And if there are any small rodents that have uh, left a urine trail behind, that urine actually fluoresces in the sunlight and they can spot that. They can use that trail to track the prey item. How cool is that? They're finding something using cues that we're completely unaware of. Birds are very incredible animals. So this here, he's, he is a, a male of his species. And we can tell that because of the, the bluish gray coloration that you see there. A female, um, she would be a little bit larger than him. And she wouldn't have the, the blues. Uh, she'd just have that kind of rusty color more throughout her body and also the tail um, here he's got just a single uh, band that goes across his tail whereas a female will have banding that runs uh, all down her tail so his hunting style again he's an aerial predator he's looking for things that he can catch on the wing insects other birds um, but I think we can go check out another bird with a completely different uh, niche as, as you remember a different uh, way that it survives in the wild. So we'll say goodbye to Leonard and Mandy. Bye, Leonard.
Thank you so much. That was so, it's so mesmerizing seeing a live bird. It's really quite distracting you know, trying to be professional here. This is very cool. <laughs> All right, we are gonna head over here and uh... so we have Butters here. Butters is a great horned owl. Oh. Very cool species. Hello, butters. So check this out. I said, but a great horned owl like this, they hang out in densely forested areas. You can check out his plumage there. That allows him to camouflage perfectly in his environment. Check out the incredibly large eyes. That gives these birds uh, binocular vision. They have incredible eyes, incredibly far distance, but even more incredible than that is their hearing. That is the main sense that they use when they're locating. Now some species of their prey. How, how cool is that? Can you imagine? Hmm. Feet as well. Now, you do find these birds in uh, colder regions, so that could help uh, dealing with the cold, but it also helps them to remain silent in flight, which we, we talked a little bit about earlier. Kind of helps cut down on some uh, air resistance when they're flying. But uh, enough talking about flying. Let's see if the butter is interested in making a little flight for us. We'll come on through here. So we have uh, our, his trainers, at Becca and Beth, here. Butters likes to uh, to work for little treats. We spoil them. See, we, we thought you had the best job in the world, John, but Becca and Beth have the best job in the world. This is very cool. Oh, but our, our connection's cutting out a little bit as we're getting here. So if you guys can still hear me, we are frozen right now. So we're going to hopefully get that back to see. Are we good to oh. stand here? Oh, there we are. We're back. Oh, we're back now, I think. There we go. Yeah, I think sure. we lost connection for a little bit there. All right. We're getting a, a demonstration here from our buddy Butters. Say that five times fast. Yeah. Ah. And as you mentioned, they're so silent when they fly. I hope our kids have had a chance to maybe look up YouTube videos where you can see different birds in flight, but owls are uncannily quiet when they fly by. You got special wings that allow them to be really silent as they go. Let's see if we can cajole butters one more time. So when you're looking at, uh, you see butters holding up those uh, those feathers on top of his head. I was talking about how they have really good hearing. That's not actually his ears, though. Those are, are feathered tufts. And he, he belongs to a group of owls that we call the tufted owls. And it's thought that those feathered tufts... Um, they kind of help break up their pattern when they're amongst the brush. Could make them look a little more like broken branches amongst the trees. But they also use it uh, for communication as well. So you may be wondering why, uh, why Butters is out here during the day. Um, you may have heard that owls are nocturnal. And it's true that a lot of, a lot of owls are nocturnal. Um, but not all of them, only about half of the species in the world are. Some of them, like uh, the great horned owl, they're what we call crepuscular. And crepuscular animals, they like to be active during the dawn and dusk. But there are owls uh, that are active during the day, just like we are. Owls like the snowy owl and the burrowing owl. When Butters was on the stump in front of us, we've never had an animal look at us more imperiously ever than Butters. <laughs> Very, <laughs> feel like I'm being judged. <laughs> oh, this is so special. Thank you, everyone. I know it's been like the whole zoo team bringing this together with us here. Um, if you're good with it, I might dive in with questions soon as we've hit the 30 minute mark. Is there anything else major you'd like to share with us before we dive in with our Q&A? Yeah, just uh, the one thing we should say, uh, happy birthday to Butters. Oh, happy birthday to Butters. There's a whole bunch of like movement in classes. So everyone's very excited about that in the background. So happy Butters birthday. Butters is eight years old today. So there's probably a few viewers here who are the same age or maybe even have the same birthday as Butters. 
Wow. Very, very cool. I was gonna ask that next. Thank you, guys. Well, are we hanging out with Butters as we do our Q&A together? Yeah, we can do our, I'm not sure how long he'll be out here, but we can definitely start our, our Q&A now. Fantastic. Well, I will just say a couple notes too. I'm so glad you mentioned the woodpecker and the tongue. I encourage everyone to like look into woodpecker tongues when you're done this broadcast. It was the freakiest thing ever. And you showed the iconic image of the Archaeopteryx, which is the most poetic Latin name in the entire world. Archaeopteryx lithographica is ancient wing written in stone, which is just amazing. So people should check that out a little bit more as a follow-up as well. I'm going to head to our live classes in just a second. We've got Miss Apollo's class. It's a great question in the chat first. She wanted to know how can our turn their heads all the way around you might be able to clear up some misconceptions about this too <laughs> yeah that, that's a, a great question that we get asked a lot um, so when you look at uh, a human neck we have seven bones they're called vertebrae in our neck birds have 14 vertebrae so they have double the amount um, so you do see him swiveling his head it's not a full 360 degrees it's about three quarters of the way around and actually all birds can do this um, it helps them to keep the feathers on their back nice and clean and to just surveil and look around. But with the, uh, the owl, it does look very mechanical. And because their eyes, most birds have their eyes on either side of their head. Owl's eyes are forward facing. So anytime he wants to see something, he has to look and face that direction. The eyes are also so large that they're fixed in their sockets. So they can't shift their eyes in their head like we can. So again, anytime he wants to look at something or look in that direction, he actually has to turn and face that direction. Yes. I'm so glad you mentioned this. I really encourage our kids, look up an owl skull when you're done this broadcast because it's one of the freakiest things in all of nature. Um, Butters, you're beautiful though. Don't worry about your skull. You're great. Um, we're going to head to Mr. B's class, joining us for their last program of the year from Benicia, California. If you guys want to unmute your mic, come on in and take us away. Hey, guys. Hi, Mr. B's class. <laughs> Hi. 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 Why can't all birds be herbivores? Ooh. <laughs> so oh <my> God. <laughs> that that's a pretty uh that's a tough question. So we, we talked about but it's a good a very good question though. So we, we talked about niches, right? So the niche is um uh, yeah, what an an the role an animal kind of plays in an environment. So if we're talking about uh, a herbivorous uh, bird, if all birds were herbivorous, they'd be all be in competition with each other for that single resource. So because birds, uh, they eat all sorts of different things and they occupy all kinds of different niches, that means they're not in competition with each other. They're only in competition with, with other birds that have that same niche. So I like that. I, I like that as an answer. That is a very complicated question, a very nuanced one. So we'll stick with that for our niches that we discussed a little bit earlier. Um, Mr. Hangar's class, we're going to head to Georgetown. If you guys have one for us, come on in. Oh, always for sure. Happy birthday. Um, but we were wondering about the size of the skulls we saw earlier. Were those the actual sizes? And one of the students saw they were yellow. So wondering why the skull was yellow. Ooh, yeah, so actually I, I, I went and I got the, uh, we do have a great horned owl replica skull. If you need to take butters out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to uh, say goodbye to Butters. It's a little warm out here. Goodbye, Butters. It's been a pleasure and an honor. <laughs> um, so, yeah, here we go. We've got the, the great horned owl skull. So it's not the real skull. This is a replica. So it's made of a resin or a plastic, and it has a kind of yellow hue to it. But, yes, these are the these are the actual sizes. So this is a great horned owl skull. Now you probably you might think that it looks a little small considering how large that bird was there, um, but birds are mostly made up of feathers. And they have some of them have uh, around seven thousand feathers typically, um, so that that makes up the majority of their bulk. Uh, if you were to remove their feathers, you see that they're actually pretty small. So this is a an owl cool. skull. That's what's underneath all those feathers. Um, here's the the bones that uh, compress an owl's eyes, that gives them binocular vision. So all birds have these bones in their eye, but uh, it's very exaggerated on an owl. Very their eyes are so huge. It takes up about three quarters of the space of their skull, their eyes, yeah. and that keeps you. them in place. I told kids to check out an owl skull and didn't even know we were gonna get one. That's amazing. Yeah. 
I will note, if you want to see how small an owl's body is, if you look up wet owls, like if they've been in a rainstorm, it's really quite shocking um, and very enjoyable as a follow-up to this. Uh, Miss Fisher's class, if you guys want to turn on your camera, Carson Bill, I can head to you guys in just a second. Uh, hi, Bush. I'll come to you guys first. If you want to unmute, you are good to go for a question with us. Hi, guys. Okay. Hi there. Uh, Vera had a question. Come on over here, Vera. Hey, Vera. Yeah. Why do birds have different kinds of beaks? Ooh, yes. Okay. That's a uh, that's a great question. There's so many different kinds of beaks. So we'll uh, just getting back over here. We'll take a look at the picture again to show some of the different sorts of beaks. So here we go. Here's some of the different kind of beaks. So. These beaks, the way that they're shaped, will help them with their niche in the environment. So here's here's a pelican. It's got a very unusual beak compared to any other uh, other bird. So you can see large beak here with the hook. And then it's got this fleshy skin pouch here. And I can use that to scoop the fish that it catches. So depending on what a bird is doing out there in the wild, their beak is adapted to help them um, do whatever it is that they're doing. So let's take an, let's look at an example here of this, uh, a bird, this is a grain eating bird. It could be something like a, a sparrow or a finch. Imagine it wanted to eat a seed inside of a pine cone. It could do that, uh, but it would, it would be a little tougher with this beak. Now this species here, they're specialized to eat those pine cone, uh, seeds specifically. So it's got a cross bill. And that allows it to do that a lot more effortlessly. So it's yeah. going to be able to eat more seeds in an hour than this uh, bird with a more generalist type beak. So depending on what you see a bird doing in the wild, their beak is going to be adapted to help them uh, make life a little easier for them. I'm really glad you brought back this because the surface skimmer one is my favorite. It's the freakiest beak in all of nature. And we got the unexpected phrase fleshy skin pouch. So thank you for that broadcast <laughs> as well. Um, I try to work that into every presentation. Yeah, excellent. For our classes too, if you look at your own teeth, we've got teeth that are meant for slicing things, teeth that are meant for grinding things at the back. If you look at something like a lion, he's got sharp teeth for tearing. So different animals have different things around their face, basically, to help them process the foods that they eat in the niche that they're in. It's a good way of thinking about it generally across the animal kingdom. And I'm really glad we got that question. Uh, Carsonville, Michigan, I'm coming to you, Miss Lou's class, Miss Bra's class, and then we'll wrap up with Mr. B's in a few minutes. We're going to do like a rapid fire round. This is exciting. Uh, but Carsonville, come on in, guys. Hey. Hi, we have Blake, and he has a question about the birds. Nice. Hey, Blake. How many species of birds do you have at the zoo? Nice. So we have close to um, 300 birds at the zoo, and we have um, it's under a hundred species. I think it's, uh, about 66 now. That's pretty good. That's good math off the cuff. I know those are my questions are really hard. So 66 and 300. There you go. That, and no one can tell you otherwise in the course of this. No, program. I was right. just making it up actually. <laughs> yeah. John's our expert du jour. I like that question, guys. Thanks, Ms. Fisher's class. I'm Ms. Lou's class. Grade fours. Come on in. Take us away. Hey. Um, my question was, um, if oh if birds are dinosaurs how are they not extinct yet is that the question yes perfect yeah, that, that's an excellent question so um the extinction event that happened 66 million years ago was a comet that hit the earth and what happened was the it was the fallout so initially when the comet hit there would have been a large it would have been like an explosion and that would have uh, wiped out a lot of the dinosaurs but then what happened was the fallout blocked out the sun around the whole planet so it was very dark so a lot of these larger animals you can imagine plants aren't going to grow as well um, some of these huge dinosaurs that are eating that vegetation aren't going to survive then some of the predators that rely on eating those vegetarian animals aren't going to survive either so it was a lot of these smaller animals that ended up surviving mammals uh, were a smaller species that lived underground um, so they weren't as affected it would have hit all of the animals really hard but the largest animals were hit hard, the hardest so some of these smaller animals were able to survive and then these smaller ones uh, went on to 
fill some of these other niches and uh, diversify uh, through evolution and become um, the 10 to 11,000 species of birds we see today or the uh, 5, 50, 400 uh, mammal species that we see. I've heard it said that everything bigger than a pug died out, basically, which is a weird way of thinking about it, but enjoyable. So. Well, I also like to work pug into every presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so thank you for we're, that. We're, we're killing it. Fleshy skin <laughs> pouch, pug. This is our new standard for exploring by the senior pants going forward. Um, we're going to wrap up with two from California. Uh, Miss Barajas' class, come on in if you want to unmute your mic and I can come check in or maybe. Oh, yeah, there we go. Hi, okay. Miss Barajas. Good morning. In. Okay, Brianna. Hey. Um. What's your favorite animal? And if you could be one of these birds for a day, which one would you be? <laughs> no pressure at all, John. <laughs> but that's yeah, that's a great question and always a, a really hard question. So I'll, I'll give two answers. So my favorite bird is called a bearded vulture. Um, and this is a bird that you find in uh, Asia. And uh, it's got, it, it only eats bones. So other vultures eat dead things, but these vultures, they only eat bones and they'll grab a large bone, fly it into the air and drop it down onto a rock. And then it smashes open and they go and they eat those little bits. It's a really cool looking bird. I encourage you to, to Google that one as well. They're, they look like living dragons. Um, my, my, one of my other favorite animals is uh, the spotted hyena. Um, so I guess I like the scavenging animals. <laughs> They're a yeah, really cool animal who can crush bones with their their powerful jaws. Uh, yeah, they're super cool. Gonna, uh, we're going to send you some bones to crush, John. You clearly got a thing <laughs> going on here, so we're going to make that happen. Yeah, uh, bearded vultures are exceptional, and I'm really glad you. That's a that's a very unique answer for that question. We've never had that before. They are a special creature, and one of the only examples of tool use in the animal kingdom, which is super super cool. So very neat. Um, we're going to wrap up with one more for Mr. Beast class. I will note, if you guys want to follow up with more information when this is done, torontozoo.com has so many incredible resources to check out. I really encourage you to use iNaturalist as a tool to explore local birds. I discovered from iNaturalist that we got bald eagles in Toronto and then went and sought them out in the areas where people see them. So you can look up any city, any area in the world, any animal, and find out where people have seen it near you, which is super cool with that app. And if you want a really deep dive in birds, The Life of Birds by BBC is the best series ever. I'll make sure to link that into our classes at the end uh, to keep the learning going. But we're going to wrap up in Benicia, California. One final question, Mr. Beast class, come on in to wrap up your year with us. Hey, unmute though first. My, <laughs> my question is, uh, yeah, no, what's the biggest bird in the world? Biggest bird on earth, yes. yes that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. And there's a few different ways that we could answer that. Um, so uh, the heaviest, tallest bird you guys probably know is a, an ostrich. Uh, they can be close to 10 feet tall, about nine, nine feet, two inches, um, and can weigh uh, over two, it's over 250 pounds. I can't remember that one exactly. Um, but then we can also look at flying birds. So if we're, if we're interested in the, the largest flying birds, we have, um, the Andean condor and the marabou stork. These are two species whose wingspan is over 10 and a half feet. We actually can look at, we do have a marabou stork over here. One of the best birds on earth. I love marabou so this stork. Is, uh, what is that thing? This is Ethel. <laughs> now I want you to look closely. You'll see that she has a, a fleshy pouch there. That's called a, a galler sack. Helps with the... Uh, helps them regulate their temperature. So a few candidates for uh, for the largest bird. Head back over here. Um, Fantastic, yeah. guys. By the way, uh, we've got people in the Facebook chat that love Ethel as well, and I love Ethel. Marabou Stork's one of the most intimidating looking animals, right up there with the Great Horned Owl, actually, on planet Earth. So the fact that we got to hang out with her for a second is amazing. John, we can talk all day. The problem is, is that we have more questions than we can possibly take in one broadcast. But I do encourage our audience, check out the Toronto Zoo's website. Like I said, so much more to discover. And for the first time in a very long time, we're doing a second program with the Toronto Zoo this month. 
So if you want to check us out for the Zoo Have You Ever Wondered event in just a little bit, it's on our website, exploringbytheseat.com. Uh, you can find that out, register for it there, and ask any question you want about birds or any other animal in the world. And if you want to donate bones for John to gnaw on or whatever he wants to do, we'd also appreciate that. That would be lovely. We're going to get him that cool dinosaur patch as well. Um, yeah. John, Greg, Mary Ellen, the entire team caring for our birds today. A big thank you to you all. And what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell. Miss Fisher, hi Bush, Miss Thu, Mr. Beach Class, thank you for joining in your last day. <laughs>